Welcome everyone uh, to our town hall session, multi-stakeholder platform regulation and the global south. Uh, my name is Henrique Forhaber. I'm one of the board members of Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGIBR. I, I represent the private sector there. I will be the moderator of this session, and Juliano is, will be the, make the online moderation. First, uh, I would like to thank the IGF organization for this space and everyone that's present here and uh, online. Special thanks to our speakers. You have six speakers. Uh, just one speaker is, is here, uh, Ms. Joan Cunha, is Program Officer in Center for Communication, Governance, and National Law, University of Delhi, and the others are in their respective countries. So you have people from Brazil, in Brazil Brasilia, in Paris, Nigeria. So you have, uh, appreciate very much the, those people that are in the late night, late, mo late uh, early morning together with us today. So uh, the first speaker will be Mariel Oliveira. Uh, she's director of the UNESCO Communication and Information Sector Division for digital inclusion, policy, and transformation. Uh, after, the, after her, her, you have Sunil Abraham. Uh, he's public policy director from Facebook India. And after him, Kadiha el Usman. Uh, he's a senior program officer for Paradigm Institute. No, she, in fact, she's uh, officer for Paradigm Institute. Uh, after you have Miriam Wimmer, uh, she's a uh, director for the Brazilian uh, uh, Authority on priv that, um, Privacy and Data Security. Uh, after you have Juan, and at the end you have uh, Renata Afla, who, uh, who is CEO from Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, we will give a Eight minutes for each speaker, and after that, we will open for questions for the audience here and also online. Okay. Uh, as you know, digital platforms have gained significant traction uh, with, uh, within the internet governance debates, as they have, uh, have become essential tools for global large scale public and private communications. However, a great part of the discussions resolves around the models followed by Europe that, as many point out, are then exported to Global South countries. Uh, we mean Global South countries as a developing economies, okay? Just the name Global South may sometimes uh, emit some uh, to other questions. So you can, you can understand the Global South countries as developing countries on this area. Uh, but uh, we see that the strong influence of Europe on regulations uh, all over the world, in so-called Brussels effect, uh, affect uh, how regulations are adapted to local regional contents. But countries in the developing economies uh, uh, are in different states, uh, different states of institutional development, considering government bureaucracy, civil society organizations, or regional or international organizations. So governance arrangements that may work in the global north can fail in Latin America countries, for instance. Therefore, it's relevant to foster that exchange of experience between global south countries to formulate appropriate regulations to regional reality involving different stakeholders. In this sense, CGIBR, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, carried out a consultation on platform regulation this year. Uh, uh, we received more than 1,000 contributions from individuals and organizations of different sectors. You are in the moment of preparing a summary to present to the society the uh, main uh, contributions about the theme that it could uh, uh, guide uh, CGIBR as, uh, to make the, their recommendations and guidelines 
for future work on that uh, field. Uh, a relevant part of the consultation uh, was precisely on the, arrangement, on the arrangement necessary for regulating platforms and about the role of multi-stakeholderism uh, could play on, do on those arrangements. Uh, countries could have different approaches on how to govern and regulate digital platforms. Normally, several government agencies are tackling with sub-teams of platform regulation. In Brazil, for instance, we have ENPD, the uh, Data Protection Agency, dealing with data privacy and data protection. You have Senacom from Justice Department dealing with consumer uh, rights. You have uh, CAD, our antitrust agency dealing with competitive issues, etc. So you, you have, uh, even in governments in several countries, in Brazil, for instance, that uh, have distributed whole on the, uh, on the, on the, on the task of uh, regulating the digital platforms. So to put in practice the most, uh, one multi-stakeholder approach to platform governance, our other se sector should uh, interact with government, with the various uh, parts of the government, in order to adjust and implement proper process to deal with uh, this no trivial task that is, is to regulate digital platforms. Even through expectations over much stakeholderism in the global internet governance realm have been questioned in several pol policy arenas, in Brazil, uh, much stakeholderism has played a fundamental role in strengthening civil cyber society participation through the means of Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Uh, CGIBR will uh, play a relevant role in the local governance, internet governance model uh, through multi-stakeholder participation and giving, it has given substantial contribution and active participation in political debates such as the construction of the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, known as Marco Civil, and the Brazilian General Data Privacy Law, GDPR. Uh, possible due to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee reputation, multi-stakeholderism was frequently mentioned in the consultation that we carried this year uh, as, a, as a value for, the, for platform regulation. In this sense, CGIBR, which, which stakeholder experiencing, even with the dif difficulties and poss possible improvements, can serve as an inspiration for institu institutional arrangements in platform regulations. Be beyond that, national and regional approaches aiming to establish a sustainable platform regulation model should also consider the challenge to align with uh, align then with ongoing international process, such as the UNESCO guidelines for regulating the platforms and other uh, task, task uh, force. This workshop aims to delve in, into different digital platforms regulations, governance models, through the exchange of global south and developing economies, practice and discuss the role of state and non-state stakeholders vis-a-vis -vis the value of internet governance multi stakeholder model. I hope you have a great conversation and that, and that each spirit uh, presented here might serve as inspiration and improvement for others. Well, now I would like to uh, pass the word to our fifth speaker, uh, Ms. Marielle Oliveira from Nesco. She's online, please. Marielsa, are you there? Yes, I'm trying to unmute myself. Oh, <laughs> hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. hello. Um, no, thank you very much for inviting me to join this session. It's really interesting. Um, but I, let me start by, by apologizing because I'll have to leave before the end of it because uh, I have another commitment. I, I have to replace somebody who um, wasn't able to, to participate. Um, so anyways, um, well, thank you very much again. And um, you, you had asked me about uh, the issues of multi-stakeholderism and how 
you know, um, what's accomplishments are increasing over the last decade and how the model can adapt uh, uh, to the present, you know, con uh, situations of the internet and, uh, and so on. So let me just start by saying that um, multi stakeholder is, is kind of a governance approach that helps policymakers to harness the collective intelligence of communities and a type of participatory democracy that emerged very much because uh, of the increasing complexity of policy making and the difficulties governance systems were facing in finding sustainable solutions to the various problems that they were facing. So most stakeholder engagement was and continues to be, in our view, the best way to build consensus around a shared set of goals and values uh, while ensuring that the result is created by taking into account the needs and concerns of a broad range of actors, including government, private sector, and civil society, and even grassroots organizations like women's groups or youth organizations, technical community, and so on. And the most complex policymaking happens at the global level. Global multi-stakeholder approaches have emerged very much as a complement to multilateral cooperation since it helps to fill uh, some of the gaps in knowledge and legitimacy that are left when global decisions are taken by a single actor. And digital development is one of the most complex processes that are, because it affects most economic, social, and environmental uh, um, aspects of our, of our life. And this is why the World Summit on the Information Society created the Internet Governance Forum specifically as a multi-stakeholder process to co-develop the principles and norms that shape internet evolution. And beyond the WISIS, uh, various organizations have endorsed the multi-stakeholder model, including UNESCO, of course, you know, OECD, the Council of Europe, ITU, the G8, African Union, even the UN General Assembly. And at UNESCO, we advanced this, this uh, multi-stakeholder concept by embedding it into UNESCO's Internet Universality Rome Framework, which proposed four principles on how the internet can support the construction of global knowledge societies, that the internet should be human rights-based, open to all, accessible by all, and multi-stakeholder-led. Um, and, and, and that has already been taken up by over 40 countries, uh, this particular framework. But um, let me say that uh, one would expect that adding greater expertise, more diversity into decision processes and encouraging consensus building would always lead to better decisions. But that doesn't really happen always because most stakeholder initiatives, they don't necessarily meet expectations every time. An effective multi stakeholder approach needs to be inclusive, diverse, collaborative, legitimate, and that doesn't necessarily happen. You know, for example, the parties involved may not have been legitimately uh, chosen to represent all the interests around a given issue. The time and the resources uh, needed for coordination may be just too much for the actual benefit. How our symmetries may exist, exist that prevent the parties from contributing equally, or multi stakeholder process is not really linked to a final decision making process. So that there's no clarity what's going to happen once the most stakeholder group arrives at uh, their consensus. And, and the internet today is very different than when it was created, as it became more and more central to how societies and economies operate. Different stakeholders, they started kind of jostling for greater power over its governance. And in addition, the reality of most stakeholder participation is actually challenged by the nature of the internet itself, including the issues of jurisdiction and enforcement, scale, and the pace at which you know, the digital transformation is, 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 uh, is taking. So some stakeholders actually have become too dominant and powerful, particularly big tech platforms, and they have a moving fast ethos that doesn't really work with the pace of other actors. The relationship between multi-stakeholder and multilateral governance mechanisms, one at global level and the other at national or regional level is not very clear yet. And the role of governments is actually challenged by the power of private sector, and they face difficulties in enforcing accountability when harms happen. And so we need to adapt the multi-stakeholder approach to today's internet that really is a platform internet. 
And for that, I think that there are some things that need to be done. First, the global community needs to really build greater awareness and buy-in on the benefits of multi-stakeholder approaches. Um, it needs to clearly identify who should be around the table to meet the different internet governance challenges because they are not the same and you don't need everybody around every issue. Cybersecurity issues, for example, uh, may be discussed by a particular group, while digital inclusion may be discussed by a different group but always most stakeholder and representing different actors uh, that have a stake on the issue. Um, we need to reduce knowledge imbalances by raising capacities of government and civil society actors on frontier technologies. We, you know, for example, we are training judicial actors uh, on artificial intelligence because we realize that many of them do not understand what the capabilities and the limitations of these technologies are and have developed a competency framework for civil servants on AI and digital transformation exactly for that. It's hard for them to sit around the table and argue for certain types of uh, approaches with private sector if they don't really understand you know, what these technologies are capable of. And the other thing is that we really need to identify relevant and legitimate stakeholders uh, to represent each of the groups and working methods that need to be more transparent and inclusive with participants collaborating on equal footing. And that means better resourcing civil society, academia, et cetera, to participate. At the global level, for example, you know, we see the difficulties that the IGF itself uh, uh, faces on resourcing. It entirely depends on donations, you know, with a tiny little budget for the secretariat. Global governance on the internet, depending on that, is, is, is really insane. But, uh, and we also need to mostly, you know, the big thing is that we need to clarify how multi-stakeholderism works with multilateralism. And then what their different roles and mutual accountabilities are. The IGF, for example, is evolving in that direction, has created a leadership panel to engage with the UN Secretary General so that you can build and create a bridge between those two processes. But we still need to account for the power imbalances that have arisen both within multilateral and multi-stakeholder processes with the powerful internet platforms located in a handful of countries. And I'm very hopeful that the Global Digital Compact will offer us a chance to reboot the approach and that the emerging global regulation of internet platforms, such as UNESCO's Internet for Trust uh, um, um, guidelines, will contribute to this process. So thank you very much for the chance to, to, to participate. Thank you, Maniosa, for your truths. Uh, now uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Samuel Abraham to make the, his speech. Uh, he's from META. Uh, in, in fact, I would like very much to understand the Indian scenario on this, uh, on this issue of uh, platform regulation, and please, uh, Sunil, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you so much uh, for that, and uh, a special thanks uh, to all my uh, friends and colleagues at uh, CGI.br. I'm uh, very grateful that they have given me another opportunity uh, to, to work with them. Uh, also, it's indeed a privilege uh, to be on the same uh, panel as uh, personal heroes, uh, such as uh, Renata. Uh, so uh, thank you again uh, for, for that. Um, I'm someone that has been involved in the IGF conversations uh, since 2005. Uh, and uh, when I came to Tunis uh, for that very, for the second WISIS uh, meeting, uh, I was there as part of civil society, uh, and I was uh, trying to make a documentary film uh, with BBC. At that point, I was also working for the International Open Source Network, and one of the people that I interviewed was uh, Gilberto Gil, uh, who was the Minister of Culture of uh, Brazil at that point, on this question of uh, open source. Uh, so uh, very quickly, as Maria Elsa has mentioned, uh, there are three clear layers 
uh, to the regulatory ecosystem, uh, classical regulation that emerges from the state, uh, co-regulation, uh, which is when self-regulation meets uh, state regulation, and then pure self-regulation, which is called the pure multi-stakeholder model, which we see in organizations like the IETF uh, and, and, and so on, especially the standards uh, setting organizations. Uh, and all of these forms of regulation uh, play a close role uh, with each other. Uh, and I'm going to take the example of India uh, to show how this is the case. In our existing IT law, uh, the Information Technology Act, the section for protecting sensitive personal data called 43A uh, is a good example of reflexive regulation. If regulated entities do not comply with the state mandated standard, ISO 27001, uh, then they get the same immunity from liability <clears throat> if they're able to propose a self-regulatory standard and then comply uh, to it. Uh, so that happened in <clears throat> uh, 2008 with the amendment and in 2012 or 11 with the rules. And then the government lost trust, <clears throat> uh, I think to some degree in self-regulation and uh, for, for uh, quite a period since then, for almost 15 years, uh, there wasn't very much new self-regulatory and co-regulatory proposals uh, made. Uh, but clearly the Indian government has decided to try again. And when it came to regulating the gaming industry earlier uh, this year and last year, they introduced the very same architecture where uh, the regulated entities were meant to come together, uh, form self-regulatory bodies, produce norms, then comply with those norms in order to be considered uh, compliant uh, with, with the law. Uh, so how does that old theme of free software and uh, open standards and open data connect uh, to all of this? Uh, here is where I would like uh, to take an example from my current employer. So after spending uh, 25 years in civil society, I've spent the last three in the private sector with uh, Meta. Uh, so how does that all uh, connect uh, to the work that I'm now doing at Meta? Uh, it's because uh, Meta is not like all the other platforms and I wouldn't uh, want to paint all platforms with the very same brush. Uh, Meta has more than 1,200 open source projects. Uh, just on AI, we have released 650 open source AI models and uh, another 350 open data sets. Uh, so let's now look at a particular anxiety. And this is the anxiety around algorithmic bias. Uh, and let's take the case study of text-to-speech and speech-to-text technologies. Uh, Meta has a tool called Massively Multilingual Speech. It's an open source tool. And this tool can ID 4,000 languages and do speech to text and text to speech for 1,100 languages. So how can we be sure that this tool does not discriminate when it comes to uh, gender, when it comes to age, when it comes to uh, uh, sexual orientation? Uh, or maybe disability. Uh, the way this has been done is Meta has also released an open data set called Casual Conversations, uh, which contains 27,000 hours of uh, people of different identities and uh, with different traits uh, speaking these languages so that the open source uh, software that has been released by Meta, a massively multilingual speech, can be benchmarked against the open data set. <laughs> so what I'm trying to argue is that while there is indeed a requirement for states to legislate uh, and to legislate after doing multi-stakeholder uh, engagement, engagement and consultation, there is also this equally important role 
of bottoms up uh, knowledge building and norm setting and uh, ideally good laws especially uh, laws in the global south will have space uh, for all of this uh, and that is the only way in which we can ensure that regulations remain future proof and constantly and in a very agile fashion address the harms that are caused by emerging technologies. Once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. Thanks, Sunil. Uh, you have next Miriam Vimeer. She is director from Brazilian DPA. Uh, Miriam, are you there? I'm here, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Good night, Miriam. As you're in Brazil Good right night. now. Good. It's very late here in Brazil. It's 11.30 p.m., but I'm, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me and for making it possible for me to participate online. I'm truly delighted to join this panel, and I'm, I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you in Kyoto. I hope you're having a great time, lots of fun and very productive discussions. Thank you. Could you give us your inputs about digital platform regulation interface with it? Uh, data privacy and, uh, and protection. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like very much uh, to receive your feedback on how much stakeholders should apply on this space. And of course, you, you're free to talk about the audiences you want. Okay, so thank you very much for the question, Enrique. Um, and I'd like to begin by mentioning that I speak from the perspective of a government stakeholder. I'm currently one of the commissioners at the Brazilian National Data Protection Authority, and I've been following the debate on internet governance for quite some time now, and currently working with data protection. So there's a very interesting intersection when we discuss platform regulation. And I'd like to begin by highlighting that one of the most important challenges we face when discussing platform regulation is in fact defining the scope of regulation and consequently identifying the institutional actors, be they governmental or non-governmental, that should be put in charge of such regulation. And I think an, an important point to start off our discussion is to mention that platform regulation may in fact mean many different things, ranging from ex ante regulation to promote competition in digital markets, to um, laws aimed, aimed at combating disinformation, to rules on labor relations through online platforms, many other things in between. And the term digital platform itself is also very broad, encompassing, just to give a few examples, marketplaces, platforms for renting rooms or calling cars, social media platforms, and of course, these different business models also have different characteristics and maybe raise different challenges in terms of protecting fundamental rights. Um, another point I think is quite relevant mentioned by Sunil just now is that the term regulation is in itself open to many different interpretations. So it includes not only state-centered regulation, which is perhaps the most traditional form of regulation, when you have a governmental agency that may apply administrative sanctions if a formal rule is not complied with, but also many other regulatory arrangements, which include co-regulation, self-regulatory mechanisms, as well as different levels of multi-stakeholder participation and supervision. And here, I think uh, a point that I, I'd like to make is that Brazil has historically su sustained that multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism are not in themselves antagonic. They're not mutually excluded necessarily. And in the same way, when we discuss regulation of digital platforms, it seems to me that it is possible to conceive models where you have traditional state regulation coexisting with co-regulation or self-regulation at certain levels. So um, I touch on these preliminary points to call attention to the fact that when we discuss platform regulation in general and the role of data protection authorities in particular, we are potentially discussing many different things, many different approaches and many different institutional actors that may be involved with this discussion. And regarding data protection authorities in particular, it's important to note that all these different business models that relate to digital platforms are essentially based on the large scale processing of data, including and especially personal data. And therefore, to some extent, data protection authorities are already naturally involved or attracted to this discussion. 
And here, um, I think it's valid also to mention that many traditional data protection principles, such as purpose limitation, transparency, data minimization, for instance, as well as several data protection rights, the traditional ARCO rights, access, rectification, cancellation, opposition, already touch upon many of the issues that are raising concerns when you discuss digital platforms nowadays. Um, also, the approach that many data protection laws bring in terms of the need to carry out risk assessments and have governance programs and transparency requirements already exist in many data protection laws, as is the case in Brazil, although not specifically geared towards digital platforms. So the feeling I have is that while many of our concerns are already somehow related to the field of data protection, of course, other concerns and other fields may be called to act. And in this sense, data protection legislation may not be in itself sufficient and other existing regulators may come into play. And I think Maria or, or Hiki mentioned antitrust, consumer protection, um, as well as several other formal governmental bodies. Um, and in fact, there is also discussion of the need to or not to create new regulators. So the, the issue, I think, at the end of the day is that there is a huge challenge of coordination and cooperation between public bodies and also the need to assess how multi-stakeholderism can build into this process in order to make it more transparent and more legitimate. Um, here in Brazil, um, specifically, this debate on platform regulation, I think, is, is currently very, very hot. It's very high in the public agenda. And I would argue that here in, in our country, it's been shaped by some factors that are quite specific to our own reality. So the first aspect is that we have a quite complex institutional setup. We are a continental country with over 5,500 municipalities. We have a federal government that is very large, very complex, many ministries, many different agencies and complex uh, and, and existing bodies with regulatory competencies that in some sense will touch upon the issue of digital platforms. And here in Brazil, the fact is that it's not easy to create new governmental bodies. Usually there are not enough financial resources, there are not enough human resources. And in fact, and this may be a common theme in, in the countries of the global south, it's very difficult to prioritize these issues in countries where often very basic needs of the population are still not properly met. So it's, it happens sometimes that new legislation uh, comes up, but it is it appears often with insufficient enforcement mechanisms, creating a real challenge in, term of, in terms of effectiveness. As an example, our Data Protection Authority, ANPD, was created in 2020, while the legislation was already in force for some months, and we had no staff members, no financial resources, and only very recently have we been able to take some important steps in terms of creating a more robust institutional structure. But a second aspect that I think is very particular to Brazil is that we have a very well-known and very consolidated model of multi-stakeholder internet governance based on the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br, who is in fact organizing this panel. And over the last decade, considering the experience we had with the CGI, with the Marco Civil da Internet, which is our civil rights-based framework for the internet, and also with the general data protection legislation, we have almost an implicit requirement that regulation aimed at the digital environment in Brazil should include a very high level of multi-stakeholder participation. This, I think, is very interesting. It's almost a, a common expectation that when we discuss regulating the digital environment, all stakeholders should somehow become involved in the discussion. I think it's, it's a very interesting and very important aspect of our domestic setup here. And this has, in fact, been true not only for the process leading up to the approval of the Marco Civil, but also for the process that led to the approval of the general data protection legislation, where we had lots of public consultations, public hearings, and intense negotiations until the very last minute, until the legislation could finally be agreed upon and approved formally by National Congress. Um, another aspect is that because we have this I think this psychological framework where we think that multi-stakeholderism is in fact important when we discuss digital regulation is that there is also an expectation that regulatory bodies that deal with uh, digital issues should also have formal consultation mechanisms in place. So in the case of the DPA, for instance, we have a legal requirement to carry out um, regulatory impact assessments, but also public consultations, public hearings, 
And in fact, we have uh, an advisory board, a consultative committee that is multi-stakeholder that involves governmental members and different members of society, academia, private sector, and so on, who is responsible for supervising and issuing advice to our DPA in terms of what our priorities should be, what our national policies should look like. So this, I think, is an interesting example. And I feel that one of the lessons we could maybe learn from the Brazilian experience is that when discussing platform regulation, multi-stakeholder participation is practically a de facto requirement to ensure that the legislation, when approved, is considered legitimate and also that it becomes, in fact, effective because of the consensus that is created around the terms that end up being approved. And in this sense, um, I think Maria Elza spoke a lot about how the multi-stakeholder model has been evolving, and I fully agree this is a concept that is still work in progress in many senses. But I do think that what we have learned from the multi-stakeholder governance model to the internet, um, which also involves understanding the roles and responsibilities of different actors, right? Um, this is certainly a model that could be taken into consideration when discussing platform regulation um, in general, taking into account also the contribution that existing legislation and existing public organizations can give to facing the challenges that digital platforms raise in our society nowadays. So thank you very much, Henrique. I look forward to the second round. Thank you, Miriam. So, uh, Juan, uh, uh, thanks to stay with us today. Uh, maybe you can talk about your research on digital platform, uh, especially in India. Thank you. Your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Joanne. I'm from the Center for Communication Governance. We're an academic center that's um, out of a national law university in New Delhi, India. Uh, Enrique was just referring to some of the, the recent platform regulation work that we're trying to do, given um, a lot of the work that's happening in India uh, on, on platform regulation, uh, where we're looking at seeing a new regulation that's going to uh, uh, that's going to look at platforms, but also emerging technologies. Um, and some of the things that I wanted to focus also in, 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 um, in light of the larger discussion here is uh, the challenges that some, uh, that India and some global South countries generally have when it comes to uh, participating in regulation uh, on platform governance. And a lot of these challenges stem from our, uh, ch our, our challenges with just generally uh, more global processes of uh, of um, of coming together in in, in forums and and participating at those uh, larger discussions, uh, and I think that that would hold true for a lot of um, other global majority countries as well. Uh, some of these discussions we've been having over the course of the last couple of days, and and the one of the first things that comes to mind more naturally is the the the, the issue of resources in general. Uh, to be able to participate in any uh, global discussion or even within our national discussions, the capacity is a huge um, is a huge factor, and I think that th that capacity, whether it's financially accessing, um, uh, financially being able to access these conversations, or uh, even just through personnel, there are there are a lot of challenges that do not allow. A, um, a lot of voices from the global majority to be present. And then, uh, of course, as a result, you have a lot of perspectives that are missing out in the conversation. Um, and that's especially when we're thinking about uh, the involvement of groups that either represent uh, directly impacted, uh, folks directly impacted from platform harms, or even, uh, I would go, even f people that are studying the impact of some of these harms. Uh, so definitely, resources is a huge consideration, um, uh, and if, just in terms of personal capacity, uh, I would think that when it comes to actually being part, of, like being in terms of meaningful participation at some of these conversations, uh, at at like the larger levels, especially, there's uh, there are limits to how much. Uh, civil society can come in on uh, to have um, to to be representative and uh, even to in, to, ha to engage in meaningful dialogue if you don't have uh, a lot of the other stakeholders like the technical community uh, with the state uh, representatives um, and uh, that kind of burden on civil society sometimes is really hard especially if that's not collaborative and 
just the point on collaborative uh, collaboration is is what I wanted to talk next. But um, just before we get to that, when we think about the like the in, in representatives from state and from industry or technical communities being uh, involved in participation, something that has come. Um, come from our research, not re related to platform regulation, um, but an indication of one of the same challenges is that in, this, in, in a project that we're working on with emerging technologies, uh, specifically blockchain, um, we're trying to explore standards development in the blockchain ecosystem. And uh, what has come out quite often in terms of some of these representatives from industry and, and even, um, and even um, stakeholder uh, um, sorry, government representatives being able to participate at the various standards uh, bodies, uh, forums, is, is uh, quite difficult for them to do given the financial constraints that it, uh, that it um, sort of places on them to be able to attend these, uh, these discussions. Uh, so not only is it expensive, but it's also, uh, it takes a lot of time and you have to have that kind of personnel. Um, but, uh, coming back to my point on on collaboration, I think that something that in the Indian context is slowly developing, but still at uh, I would say not a not a stage to be able to make uh, that much of um, a difference is that a, a, our civil society is is slowly building up collaborations within. We have worked with each other. Uh, over a very long period of time, but to be able to have that kind of um, uh, collaboration that we've had in specific instances to be able to uh, effectuate uh, movement on regulation is somewhat slower, especially, I would say, and this is a, it, it's, it's a challenge that uh, can be there in some parts of the Global South, but having that, uh, th that fragmentation can often um, make it difficult to be um, uh, to have to have support at uh, general uh, forums that we are having these discussions in. Um, but in India, we've seen a couple of instances where this has worked really well. In in when we had our data protection bill uh, being contemplated, and it's been going on for years now. I think we we just had the bill uh, uh, come into into um, um, into law and. Uh, some of the initial responses to the data protection bill had a lot of uh, civil society uh, gathering together to um, to offer joint comments to uh, push the needle on conversations. Uh, similarly, when we had um, issues with uh, the, with net neutrality in India, I think around 2014, 15, uh, there was. There was a there was huge collaboration within not only civil society but like other but other stakeholder groups. We had uh, the the technical community also come together and uh, collaborate to make uh, m to make that change in uh, in saying that we we needed net neutrality uh, to um, that we needed net neutrality and then the proposal at that point was was not was not okay, um, but. Just that this, because uh, our stakeholder system um, is still developing in how we collaborate with each other, we're still uh, we're still in the process of being multi-stakeholder within this context itself, and to bring that even into global forums is is in the process of happening. Uh, and something from the way that we work at the organization is that we are, and, and this is also true for other organizations in this space, is that we're trying to be more um, um, interdisciplinary, have that multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach to the way that we even have conversations at a national level, trying to get in, um, being uh, from a space that's largely academic and legal oriented to ensure that you have social scientists, you have the technologists in the room when you're trying to think about uh, how that po how policy making should happen. Uh, just having those voices, I would say, is something that is slowly, there's a conscious effort towards it. Um, I think that uh, another linked challenge has been that um, when it comes to decision making, uh, Within the Indian context, uh, there are different approaches to stakeholder participation 
in policy uh, in policy making for example when i was talking about net neutrality in india that was something um that we saw we, we saw proposals in a different manner it come out in a different manner for example our uh, telecom regulation authority uh, offers the, op the 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 point of participation before an entire bill has sort of come into uh, the public forum, so you have the opportunity to comment on a proposal, you have the opportunity to participate in how the idea is being developed. Um, and there's there's also a different approach that sometimes happens where with, uh, say, our, our Data Protection uh, Act that came out and possibly with the new uh, Digital India Act, is that uh, your, part your, your point of participation starts at uh, a draft bill, and so the, in your, the involvement that you have uh, at those beginning stages as uh, a stake as stakeholders is somewhat limited and so that also plays a role in how much you can have that level of stakeholder participation um, and just one last thing before I, I close is that I think that uh, and this once again holds true I think for m most context uh, in, in the global majority is that uh, when you're thinking about participation uh, in terms of having all of your stakeholders together, uh, it, it play, makes a huge difference if the, the kind of dynamic, dynamics that are involved, it, if, the, if it's asymmetric, uh, if it's between civil society and the state or the state and platforms, the way that it plays out in each jurisdiction has a huge bearing on how you have that kind of uh, participation uh, in in your own context and kind and having to tailor your uh, approach depending on what what works best for your context is extremely important and i think that's one of the things we can take away even when we're thinking about uh, multi stakeholder participation at the global uh, in global processes and discussions is that um, ensuring that that diversity and representation is is not uh, just um, it's not dominated by certain groups. You have actual representation that is uh, is um, is properly diverse. You to ensure that um, those kind of asymmetries, those kind of power dynamics, no longer uh, no longer are present. And uh, and I think that it, it takes a lot of it takes conscious effort to try and create those. Uh, um, those mechanisms that allow for this, um, but yes, I wanted to I wanted to end on the point on um, uh, power dynamics because I think that that is something that we can we can take and learn from our own context, even when we approach uh, more global forums and and how the global south participates at some of these global forums. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, Ms. Khadija is not online. Maybe she has a problem. So our next speaker will be Renata Avila. She's CEO from Open Knowledge Foundation. Please, Renata, uh, give your opinions and, and comments on the, the, those issues that we are talking here. For yours. Uh, thank you so much. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be invited to this panel. Uh, 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 CGI is an organization that I admire. Uh, I consider it a home away from home. Uh, it is a place where you feel that you feel and you sense the the demo what can, what can be a democratic governance of the internet and. And now that Brazil is back, as we say outside, we can say it from, from the outside uh, in a more easy way. Now that Brazil is back in the multilateral and multi, uh, multilateral arena. Um, I'm coming here with a great hope of what we, could, we can achieve with this uh, interaction multilateral with the multi-stakeholder uh, model that Brazil has uh, developed in the uh, processes that Brazil is going to lead in the very near future, including G20. I would tell you a little bit more about those dreams uh, in a minute. But the, what I want to uh, talk when talking about multi-stakeholder governance uh, is uh, I want to talk from the perspective of the place I come from. Uh, I want to talk the, from the perspective of countries with a huge democratic deficit, with brutal inequalities within society 
and with a very, very, very weak and, uh, government hit by austerity measures constantly. And in such context, and just to give you an example, we in Guatemala do not even have a, a privacy and data protection law. It's 2023, and we don't even have that law. Um, in, in such context, um, something that becomes very, very, very important in, in this um, multi-stakeholder model is for companies to understand uh, um, the relevance of not taking advantage of the, you know, like taking advantage of a democratic deficits of lack of legislation just to, uh, you know, go forum shopping and doing whatever they want in some jurisdictions while upholding uh, the goal, uh, the uh, very high uh, rights standards just because the legislation, for example, in the European Union is more sophisticated than the legislation in Guatemala. Uh, something that often um, um, is observed from the outside, is observed from civil society in countries like mine is that precisely, that makes, makes uh, people um, using a platform in a different jurisdiction feel very like, you know, like mistreated and somehow abandoned by uh, a company that applies double standards uh, higher uh, protection to some users uh, than to others and higher mechanisms uh, of, uh, you know, more efficient mechanisms of just because the, the uh, le legislation in some countries forces uh, companies to do so. And that, uh, uh, I want to highlight it because we have suffered in, in very complex um, um, settings such as elections in, in the region when we see, for example, dedicated offices for the big countries that represent an interesting share of the market uh, uh, for, uh, for some electoral processes and a fluid cooperation and dialogue between uh, civil society and the companies. And in other countries, some companies will have like a closed doors meeting with powerful, not necessarily you know, the most ethical actors and civil society will have like, you know, a door slammed in the face and will like, you know, try to like, try to find someone who might know someone inside of the company and try to go through back channels to, to make uh, the, the company aware of a of very serious problem. Um, we also have a, a problem when the government is not the most ethical government in the world. And uh, there's enough suspicions from the outside that the government is colluding with uh, certain companies to um, either, like you know, get away with um, labor, um, uh, you know, uh, labor violations, or even even more concerning, you know, like with with um, deals, internal deals to favor uh, favor like uh, the position of the government and enforce it without. Um, uh, an adequate uh, uh, law framework. Um, the, I, I want to also uh, highlight here um, the importance when you have a weak government that doesn't have a dedicated office uh, for or a mechanism for uh, facilitating this multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, often, what it happens is it it, it goes it, it goes to the. Um, um, the, the organism in charge is often the Ministry of Communications. It's often like, you know, I don't know, it, it is the automatic default that it goes to the Ministry of Communications. And it usually, um, while it might, it might look to the outside that uh, through a multi-stakeholder process is taking place, what it happens is a lot of participation washing. A uh, nice couple of tables, what you like, you know, invite someone from industry, someone like, you know, like a NOS ARC approach. Two from here, two from there, two from there. And a couple of pictures are taken. And then a decision that is affecting a lot of communities not, not present at the table is taken without notice. Um, often missing from the table, missing even from the government side is the office of the, uh, the human rights uh, organism, the National Human Rights Office. The ombudsman is not present. The health 
uh, authorities are not present. Nobody representing the interest of uh, children is present. Nobody uh, representing the interest of um, indigenous peoples is present. In, in the case of my country, for example, is very relevant. Um, the, the problem uh, when, when it, there's a not an adequate uh, multi-stakeholder model uh, is that this leads to a completely unbalanced while looking from, uh, from the outside as participation, what, what it is often the validation of uh, the most powerful act, uh, actor of, at the table uh, point of view. Um, I want to refer like very quickly to specific things that different actors uh, in such context could take to, to, uh, to achieve better uh, multi-stakeholder governance. In the, in the case of companies, uh, when you are like a, a, a dealing with a small country, having ex explicit contact points is incredibly useful as a shortcut uh, of uh, establishing communication between different actors. Um, personally, I have I have to, I have had to do it with three countries, finding even the contact person when the company doesn't have an office in the country, even in moments of emergency when there's death threats or there's like very serious situation going on. Is impossible. So having a specific po point of contact in a place that's accessible to all actors is extremely important. The second is do not um, do not do the double standard thing. I know that that's very challenging because I, I know that the companies uh, have one objective that is profit and that's it. And sometimes it's easier not to comply with the highest standard of regulation, but for users it means a lot. And uh, the um, other thing is try to adopt this approach that you, you will have to adopt now uh, with the DSA in, in Europe or have policies, procedures, measures and tools available uh, for people to understand how you are operating in the, uh, uh, you are operating your, your companies. We understand that many of the trade laws protect companies and enable them to be as opaque as possible. But in this context, if you have a commitment to multi-stakeholderism, uh, you have to be more trans proactively transparent. And that leads me to academia. You have to uh, open your doors to ac academics as well uh, to understand really what is going on inside. Access to uh, that data and openness to understand what is going on will provide us with enough information to come at the table and have meaningful participation rather than just performative uh, participation and the nice picture at the end. For governments, I think that the interagency approach is urgent. It can no longer belong uh, you know, like to just one unit. It can no longer be an issue of uh, the Ministry of uh, Telecommunications of a technical office somewhere uh, um, dealing with the uh, science and technology. It has to be, it's an issue that now is central uh, to public law and to the most, uh, at the highest level of, uh, of the institutions that make the uh, government operative. For civil society, I think that um, looking uh, inside, it, it is also necessary not only have the internet experts at the table, again, being intergenerational, being intercultural, and being aware of the tremendously uh, complex rural urban divide and of course, the gender divides is necessary and, and having an internal process within civil society uh, to reach broader consensus is also very, 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 very important. And not to replicate uh, societal uh, exclusions. And then we, we need to, to understand that um, there's a, another, another process that we have seen uh, as a reaction in many countries of, uh, uh, of the lack of multi-stakeholder approaches that are like really meaningful. And that is, we have seen more, like not only nationally, but transnationally, the um, organization of users from different sectors around the around a platform, protesting against the platform. We have seen it with Make Amazon Pay, for example. Uh, that's an, a very interesting uh, example on when you have a deficit in the governance and participation of people, people will organize and protest against uh, what they see unjust. 
Uh, that said, uh, for uh, countries that are doing it well, what I, the only thing that I can hope is that the model is shared broadly with other countries that need a similar uh, approach and having a model, a multi-stakeholder participation, uh, a general frame will be extremely useful for countries, for example, in Latin America and in Africa to replicate and having a South-South cooperation will become key uh, to be stronger, not only as isolated countries, but as regions to have a better leverage with the legislation that we want and the frames that we want from the companies, but also to increase uh, cooperation and collaboration uh, across academia and across civil society that is meaningful. Um, yeah, that, that's it. I would say like the, the most important part of what I said is being aware of that it, not everything is the EU and not everything is a country as sophisticated as Brazil or India. Let's look outside and see how we can help. Thank you, Renata. So we have time for the debate here. Uh, if you have questions here at the, at the audience, Please go to the mic, and we also have a couple questions online. I, I believe it's, you first uh, respond uh, or put to, uh, to our speakers a question f that comes online, and after, please go to the mic and make your considerations also in questions. Uh, Julian, uh, do you have something from uh, online? Thank you, Henrique. <clears throat> we have received two questions. I may read them through here. Uh, first question is, platform regulation may present a broad regulatory agenda. How to cope with the transversality of the phenomenon of platformization in developing national regulation for digital platform? Second question is, Considering the challenges of digital platform regulation governance, what are the <clears throat> pros and cons of a centralized model with more state protagonism in a polycentric model with a more balanced protagonism between states and civil society? So uh, all the speakers are free to respond at one of those questions, uh, one, of, one of you could uh, exercise on that, please. Um, I could perhaps offer some some initial comments, Enrique. Um, so, so I think both questions are really interesting, and they discuss the, the question of the institutional setup to deal with a phenomenon that is very cross-cutting, very transversal and reflects, in fact, I think a, a broader, in a broader sense, the idea of platformization of everything, government platformization, private business models platformization. And I think both questions are, are very relevant because they touch upon the idea that multiple regulators may at some point in time be called to act um, when dealing with digital platforms. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the, the huge challenge we have is firstly making sure that these different pieces of legislation fit well together in, as a, in a jigsaw puzzle that creates a coherent picture. And I think this is a challenge not only for the Global South, but also for Europe, for instance, who is discussing DSA, DMA, AI Act, GDPR, and the pieces seem to not be yet quite fully uh, inter interoperable. Um, and the second issue then is how to make sure that in the day-to-day uh, enforcement of legislation, the different regulators are actually speaking to each other and making sure that their approaches are coherent and they are acting under a systematic understanding of the whole legislation applying to the digital scenario, which is huge and cross-cutting, as mentioned. I think the second question raises also an interesting point when it compares centralized models versus polycentric models involving state and civil society. Um, I, I would argue that the models, uh, a centralized model for platform regulation does not really seem 
feasible simply because platforms raise so many questions and so that many different fields such as labor relations, um, misinformation, human rights protection, uh, competition aspects. So it does seem to me that we it, it doesn't really make sense to discuss a centralized regu regulator for the entire entire digital ecosystem. So we would necessarily be discussing the need for multi-agency cooperation in government, which is the point I think Hanata made in her in her speech previously. Um, and my feeling is that in the same way that we can discuss the compatibility between multi-stakeholder and, and multilateral approaches, we can also discuss models and frameworks that involve both traditional governmental regulation, but also associated with multi-stakeholder participation. And I think there are many different models we could debate. I think there is a a model in place in Brazil, which could certainly be perfected, which involves agencies with uh, advisory boards, with mandatory participation procedures. And here again, I would like to echo what Hemata said. We cannot simply have this, you know, just for show. We need meaningful participation. This is, in fact, a challenge. But I would say that a polycentric model involving different state organizations, but also civil society, seems to me to me to be more appropriate considering the complexity of the digital environment and the many different aspects that we are aiming to regulate when you discuss platform regulation. Thank you. Uh, Sunil uh, raised his hand and also Renata. Please, Sunil, make your comments. Yeah, th th thank you so much. I also uh, wanted to connect uh, what uh, both these questions are interrogating uh, with the uh, point that Joanne made earlier, uh, and like to uh, recall the case study of the conflict between 5G and 5GI, uh, indigenous uh, standard proposed by both academics and also Indian government uh, entities. Uh, as uh, Joanne argued, uh, the lack of uh, structured resources in order to ensure that there is regular participation at uh, fora such as uh, 3GPP uh, resulted in the Indian uh, proposal uh, that covered rural connectivity and remote connectivity, uh, low mobility, large cell. Uh, that proposal was not uh, part of the main 5G standard. And uh, then the Indian community decided to uh, fork the standard and have an alternative indigenous standard uh, that would have come with uh, big consequences, uh, especially losing out on the network effects of hardware manufacturing. But fortunately, that story ended well. And uh, the 5G uh, committee accepted uh, the LMLC extension uh, to the standard. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is, when I hear questions, uh, as you have read out, I'm always tempted to answer both and. It is almost th that we always need uh, everything that is being uh, proposed. And I'll use two examples. Uh, let's look at open standards such as WCAG for disability. Uh, ideally, a mature standard like that should be mandated by the state. Uh, that is the way we will protect the rights of the disabled. But uh, another inquiet space, uh, as I had just covered in my first intervention, uh, fairness benchmarks for AI models. Uh, that is somewhere where multiple benchmarks are evolving. And uh, perhaps we don't want a mandate at this point uh, because uh, there are some companies pursuing an open model, other companies pursuing a proprietary model. Uh, we need fairness benchmarks that work for everybody. Uh, and therefore, a mandate at this stage is premature, and therefore the polycentric vision of governments, governance is much more uh, appropriate. Uh, I'll end my comments there. Yeah, and I wanted to also respond to the second question, um, and I also agree with the Sunil that is both and, and what I the and my aunt is um, uh, civil society needs access to the problematization and need mechanisms to trigger the multi uh, stakeholder mechanism. It is usually top down and does not bottom up, 
and that's a problem you know like uh, it is only when well, we need to launch campaigns and we need like to make a lot of noise from the uh, side of civil society to finally trigger the mechanism often or, or wait for the next meeting or so on and i think that if civil society is enabled to design the process if we if some room is given for civil society to uh, design and, and trigger this process to be activated uh, when discussing uh, um, a problem or discussing something urgent, uh, discuss, discussing something relevant, uh, yeah, the multi-stakeholder will be, the, this uh, polycentric uh, approach will be like uh, more agile, uh, but also the centralized uh, approach will be more agile. I, again, you know, like um, I, remember the robust uh, case of uh, Marco Civil and then the net mundial process that uh, took place in Brazil. And how did, did uh, I, I remember that I was dividing my day between two spaces. It was the net mundial, the arena net mundial, when youth was participating, when that, like, it, it, was, it was actually something arena net mundial was a process that was bottom up. It was a process that, okay, if all the countries are like gathering dirt and there's a lot of, of noise, very technical, let's create a space uh, for expression with our own rules, uh, sh uh, showing instead, instead of just telling people uh, how we are making the, the, the internet work. And it was quite wonderful to have this coexistence of more creative and open spaces uh, showing how, how the um, technology, technology is lived by different uh, parts of the of the society, and not only the you know like the invitation on, only meeting with just one spot for one member of the society. Um, so access to problematization, access to the design of the process, and a possibility to activate the processes when needed. Thank you, Renat. We have a question for the audience, Camila. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Camila Leite. I'm from the Brazilian Institute of Consumers Defense, EDEC. And we're talking lots about uh, how the challenges are transversal to lots of issues and how it's important to cooperate. Uh, you were talking about cooperation in terms of different stakeholders, so multi-sectorialism between authorities, between different laws, and also between different countries. But beyond of this important role of cooperation, we also have some challenges related to cooperation. Like I'm very supportive of that, but we have to face these challenges. And I know that we have lots of challenges when we're talking about dynamic markets, markets when we're talking about new regulations. But for example, in, term, in terms of uh, cooperation between authorities, we can take longer to answer. We might have a decision that might be a soft law than a hard law when needed. And it might be necessary, but it might postpone some important actions. And the regulation might solve that, but uh, the, uh, the time can be, can be longer. And also between countries, we have these global issues, but sometimes we have uh, different answers in different countries, which might be also uh, a response to the national or into the regional context, but we are talking about global problems, we are talking about a national uh, context, so how can we harmonize that? I know that we don't have a silver bullet to all of that, but how can we face these challenges related to, to cooperation? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Camila. Uh, someone for the, on the speakers could uh, respond or comment. Um, um, I don't really feel uh, entitled to respond, but I can certainly comment. And I think Camila has a very important point when she states the practical difficulties of cooperation. And I, I speak in the position of a civil servant who has been working in government for 17 years now almost. And in fact, the truth is that cooperation does not arise spontaneously because people wish to cooperate. It has to be crafted into legislation. There have to be procedures for cooperation to take place. And even when this exists, it's not always easy. It's usually hill up. As a regulator, I say we take twice as much time when we have to convince other governmental agencies to reach consensus in a certain position. So it's not easy, but it is necessary, I think. And I think it's a bit the same, same position we have with regard to uh, multi-stakeholderism and public participation. It takes time. It's, it's really, it gives lots of work for regulators to analyze contributions in a substantive manner. 
you know, not only for show, um, it makes procedures take longer than they would if we decided in a top-down manner, but it is important to make the, the end result more legitimate and more effective in my point of view. So I, I don't really have the answer for that, Camila. I think you have an important point, but I don't see any way around cooperation. Renata? Renata? Yeah, ve very quickly, that sometimes, you know, like civil society can be like the secret weapon for that cooperation to happen. Well, it happened with a case on WhatsApp, actually, when WhatsApp, WhatsApp wanted a couple of years ago to change their policies and, you know, to get lots of people in the Global South to simply accept and update on terms and conditions. Um, and the, it was amazing cooperation among the antitrust and consumer protection authorities behind, you know, behind, uh, it was not very public, but it was happening. Uh, and civil society facilitated exchange of um, practices and exchange of cases that they were, a couple of cases were launched in uh, the EU and in Turkey. And then these authorities shared how the, the, the reasoning behind a, a case of a, a antitrust case in this change of conditions because of dominant position and so on. It was quite amazing to see when we connect, like civil society was like the facilitator for the connection of authorities of consumer protection and, and antitrust and the magic happened because, you know, like they could uh, talk to their peers on a specific case and that's also a, a very important um, aspect of, uh, of multi-stakeholder cooperation. Not all the stakeholders need to be uh, uh, invited at the table at the same time all the times. It can happen. Um, collaboration can happen between actors, not necessarily always involving the same actors in the government and always involving uh, the private sector. Sometimes we need our time and our space to share uh, without some of the actors. And it, it, it enables good things to happen. Thank you, Hanat. Uh, I have a question I would address to Sanyu Abraham uh, as uh, a person from Meta. Uh, as soon as we have the, this, those new regulations on platform on Europe, uh, how you think, or how, how you happen with the meta uh, platforms uh, 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 global? Because somehow the, when we implement some uh, features on, on the system to uh, uh, comply with European regulation, maybe it will be worthwhile to that this, those uh, features should be applied to other geographies. So. Uh, can you respond about how you think it will happen uh, after the approval in Europe of DSA, DSA and the MA? Please, Abraham, if you can answer. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that uh, question. So uh, I can uh, shed a little light on how uh, the regulation readiness teams uh, within Meta operate. Uh, what, what basically happens is uh, there are uh, policy teams and legal teams that keep track of a variety of uh, enacted law and also proposed law uh, across many, many uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and when the engineers are analyzing this corpus of laws and obligations, both current and future, uh, their compliance engineering approach is uh, to build uh, for artifacts that can be deployed in multiple uh, jurisdictions. So you're absolutely right that if a particular user right is enabled, for example, in the GDPR, uh, then that user right is also rolled out in other jurisdictions where that legal obligation may not exist uh, at all. Uh, but there are also instances where uh, the legal obligations are conflicting. So, uh, for example, there are legal obligations in the Indian context uh, that conflict with uh, legal obligations uh, from other jurisdictions. And then uh, the task before the engineers is to build uh, compliance to both uh, obligations. And in, in those cases, uh, it is not always possible to roll out 
something that is specifically there in Europe, uh, across the world. I'll go back to the point uh, Renato made about having an explicit contact point. Uh, this is something that is quite mature uh, within the context of European uh, regulations. In uh, Indian uh, law, uh, especially the IT law, law, there is a requirement to have uh, three people employed by the global corporation and stationed uh, in uh, the India office. Uh, and these three people have to be, be available both uh, to users, at least uh, one of them has to be, and then uh, the others have to be available uh, to uh, government stakeholders. Uh, and this is uh, something, as Renato pointed out, is a uh, obligation that is user empowering. Uh, that is uh, definitely the case. Uh, but unfortunately, the obligation also comes with personal criminal liability. And uh, the uh, additional uh, complexity in the Indian law uh, makes it uh, much harder for us to automatically sort of homogenize our uh, compliance approach. And therefore, uh, compliance in one jurisdiction often will look different from compliance in another jurisdiction. Thank you. So we are short in time, so I, I will ask for our speakers from his final remarks, starting from Maria Elza. Maria Elza, please. Ah, Maria Elza is left. We have to leave already. <laughs> it's, uh, of course. So, Juan, if you can start making your final comments. Thank you. I think that we've covered a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of different things, a lot of um, different topics within how we should approach platform uh, regulation in in the south, in global majority. It's very our approaches, of course, have to be extremely tailored to our uh, specific context. Um, and uh, the questions that we had uh, just just now, like we've like the speakers have said, that there, there aren't any clear answers. Um, but I would just say that I think that uh, as we're currently trying to understand how to regulate for our own context and to see what what those nuances are that need to reflect, uh, even in global conversations, I think that uh, it will definitely give us a better sense of what we should expect and what we should uh, rally for when we're thinking about um, just uh, platform regulation and general governance in like in the larger in larger conversations. Thank you. Okay, uh, next meeting. Uh, one minute for your final comments because we're short of time. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to take part in this debate. It was really illuminating. I, I really enjoyed the comments and I look forward to other opportunities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sanyu, please, your, your final comments. Yeah, again, a very quick uh, intervention to say that I agreed with another point that Renato made on transparency being the best antidote uh, for a variety of uh, concerns. And I'd like to point to upgrades uh, to our election ads, uh, to our ads library, which, uh, which I think is important for civil society and academics to hold us to account. Thank you. Thank you. Renata? And last, last words, South-South uh, cooperation. Uh, we have a big imbalance of power here. And imperfect multi-stakeholder models in many, many countries. So let's share the good multi-stakeholder uh, practices uh, regarding platforms. And let's learn from each other and connect uh, not only uh, across uh, different multi-stakeholder uh, bodies in different countries, but as communities uh, of people studying the platforms, uh, of people holding the platforms accountable, and let's share uh, the good the good results, but also let's share when we are not successful the results that that led like the, the when there's democratic deficit and, and and a problem is caused locally. We need to document this well, uh, so it's not repeated elsewhere. And so the big platforms that are like serving many users in many countries can correct promptly. Uh, with the pressure of more than one jurisdiction. Thank you, Renata. So, 
thank you for everybody that participated in this fruitful debate. Uh, I hope uh, uh, that the debate is con uh, you continue inside IGF and in other e areas. And I'm willing to say that the CGIBR is working very hard on that issue. I mean, in Brazil, with our consultation and next recommendations, and I will keep it informed about the results of our consultation in Brazil. Thank you very much. So we'll close the session. Thank you.